It is truly the end of an era. On Thursday, September 8th, British monarch Queen Elizabeth II passed away after an unprecedented 70-year reign. Elizabeth was 96. She ascended to the throne at the age of 25 after the death of her father, King George VI. Just two days before her passing, she was still performing her royal duties when she welcomed the new British prime minister at her home at Balmoral. The world's attention has been captivated by the pageantry and the tradition of the passing of one monarch and the ascendancy of King Charles III. Here to share their thoughts on all of this, historian and author of Faith of Our Fathers, A History of True England, Joseph Pierce, and fellow Englishman and the National Catholic Register's Vatican correspondent, Edward Penton. Thank you both for being here. Joseph, I'll begin with you. What was your reaction when you heard that Queen Elizabeth had died? Well, I think that one of great sadness, because it, it is literally the end of an era. None of us remember when she wasn't queen, and nobody remembers a, a, a kingdom that wasn't uh, had a king. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, it was... Um, it was it was it was something which is very sad for I think every every Englishman and every every Briton um, to to see the passing of of uh, such a long lived and gracious queen. Mm -hmm. Edward, uh, I know you were fond of the queen, and we'll talk in a bit about the the tribute you wrote to her. Yes, yes, no, like like Joseph, it came uh, as a as a shock. Obviously, we all knew it was going to come fairly soon. He was ninety six, but. Um, but in the end, it sort of um, happened really rather rapidly. But yes, I mean, she, she'll be much missed. She was a great rock for the nation. She was a such a stable force, really, um, yeah. and mm -hmm. really comes from her faith, I believe, but also the the, the institution itself. Um, so yes, yeah. it was a it's a very sad day for us all. Really. I want to pick up on that. Throughout her life, the Queen was progressively more open about her faith, especially in those Christmas addresses, even as the world in the UK became more secular. This is from her last Christmas address in 2021. Watch. That in the birth of a child, there is a new dawn with endless potential. It is this simplicity of the Christmas story that makes it so universally appealing. Simple happenings that form the starting point of the life of Jesus, a man whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation and have been the bedrock of my faith. Now, now Joseph, uh, Queen Elizabeth II was known as the defender of the faith, and she held that title, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. What does that title really mean today, and what does the role entail? Well, the, the, there's a, 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 a historical anomaly, of course, because that title was originally uh, given to King Henry VIII um, by the Pope for King Henry VIII's uh, uh, defense of Catholic orthodoxy against the ideas of, of, of Martin Luther. And then, of course, Henry VIII, as we know, broke with the church, uh, destroyed the monasteries and converts, became a tyrant who had his own wives executed. So there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a deep irony. But I think with the Queen, there's, there's um, a, a real sense that she was defending the faith one of the most uh, one, of, one, one of the one of the less uh, enlightened comments uh, by Charles, uh, now King Charles the Third, many years ago, was he said he didn't want to be known as the defender of the faith. Yes, uh, which sounded I'm going to get to that, but I just just defender of faith, which is largely meaningless. Yeah. So I hope that he's going to follow in Queen Elizabeth II's footsteps by being a defender of the faith, as in the Christian faith. And you're completely correct that as as she got older, she became more orthodox, uh, what we might call higher church, uh, more Catholic, um, with, you know, very, very good positive things said about several of the popes and about Mother Teresa. So uh, a very, very good person and a good Christian. And quite frankly, having, having written a history of Catholic England, probably the most virtuous monarch England's had since, since the reign of uh, St. Edward the Confessor a thousand years ago. Wow, there's an endorsement I didn't expect. Interesting. Uh, Edward, you wrote a tribute uh, piece to Her Majesty, and you shared some of your own family history. Your great-grandfather was the Garter Principal King of Arms, responsible for the sovereign, uh, for ceremonial and herald heraldry duties. Uh, it was your ancestor who proclaimed 
both Edward VIII as well as George VI King. And you write that he also had a hand in Elizabeth's coronation when she showed er, very early on a selfless streak and a consideration for others. What did she do? Yes, well, during her coronation, uh, my great grandfather, Sir Gerald Wollaston, was actually helping the coronation. He, he'd retired by that time in 1952, 53. Um, but he was called on because of his experience to help the Duke of Norfolk, who is the traditionally always organized the the coronation, who's Catholic, actually, because it is a very Catholic uh, ceremony. And so Sir Gerald uh, was helping him, uh, but it happened to be the day of his birthday, which was June the 2nd, 1953. And uh, the Queen, despite all of the things she had to remember, she remembered to wish him a happy birthday. So it was a nice, a nice story that showed very much uh, her consideration for others and her selflessness, which, which we saw throughout her reign. Hmm. Joseph, where did the Queen's faith originate? Was it the Queen's Queen Mother? I know she was a churchgoer. I mean, it's not the case that every monarch, as you alluded to earlier, uh, who is the head of the Church of England, is necessarily a committed and practicing Christian. Do you think that she saw her role as Queen as part of a vocation, almost a religious vocation? Yes, I do. And I think it's very important because you're quite correct that there have been kings of England uh, who have been de facto uh, agnostics, even as they are de jure defenders of the faith. And that wasn't the case mm. with, with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She was a devout Christian. And one thing I liked about it, I found rather interesting, is she was very keen on uh, accentuating the fact that she was descended from the Stuarts. Um, and in other words, sort of de distancing herself somewhat from the Tudors. Uh, and the fact that, that Charles uh, this week was seen wearing the Charles Edward Stuart tartan, and of course, you know that that the the, the Jacobite uprising of the 18th century was were the efforts to restore the deposed Catholic King James II, the last Stuart King of England. So it's interesting, even historically, she seems to sympathise, shall we say, with the with the Catholic side of things. Hmm. Edward Queen Elizabeth met with five popes in her lifetime: uh, Pius the Twelfth. John the 23rd, John Paul II three times, uh, Benedict, and then Pope Francis. What influence do you think they had, if any, on her faith, especially John Paul II, whom she met so many times? Well, I think there was a great um, ident identification with the, with the values that they held, that she also held. I mean, she was, she had, as, as Joseph was saying, great Christian uh, values and, and a deep faith. Um, obviously, it was the Protestant faith, it was the Anglican faith, but at the same time, um, I'm sure she saw a lot of commonality with with the popes of the past, and 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 I think that was what um, made her visit the, the the Vatican so often. I think she 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 had a great sort of um, she could, as I say, she could identify with them and, and their values, and uh, and I, she was very warm also with the Catholic Church in the in England too. I mean, she. She used to call Cardinal Basil Hume, for instance, her cardinal. She was very fond of him and, and, and of all the cardinals as well. Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor, she liked, she liked his, uh, his sense of humor, I believe, and, and, and others. And so I think um, she, she was very fond of, of the Catholic Church in general, I believe, and, and the Pope especially. Mm. Well, I, I also imagine, Joseph, she felt a kinship with the popes in the sense that you take on this enormous responsibility and weight of office. Uh, I had a friend who was part of the royal household uh, at one point and was present when uh, apparently she learned of Pope Benedict's abdication. And she said, no, no, it cannot be. Um, your reaction to that and, and this idea of duty uh, and that you can't give up the office. Well, the first thing I would say is that her her sentiments echoed mine exactly and precisely. And I hadn't heard that before. Um, yeah, I think there's, there was a great reconciliation. I do believe that she saw uh, um, a connection. You know, the popes are defenders of the faith, and she is a defender of the faith. And of course, there is a difference between. Anglicanism and Catholicism, and, and she would not want to minimize that or, or to explain it away. But the point is, she was, I think, you know, moving towards a more orthodox understanding of things. I think that is clear, as you say, that if you, if you actually look at the progress 
of her Christmas addresses to the nation mm -hmm. and the Commonwealth over the years, then the older she got, the more Catholic those addresses and the more overtly Christian those addresses became. So I think there was a great reconciliation between the British monarchy and the, and the papacy, uh, which, is, which is due almost entirely to her own role. Mm. Edward, you write in your piece that the Queen passed legislation that was contrary to natural law, uh, and you point to legalized abortion, same-sex marriage. Now, she gave royal assent to each of these, a formality required for legislation, all legislation. Now, given her faith, she certainly had the ability to oppose those items, but she and she could have withheld her assent. But what would that have meant? What would the reaction have been, do you think? if she had withheld her assent? Yes. Well, I think it would have probably led the country into a sort of constitutional crisis. And I think that's that's probably why she didn't do it. I think also um, uh, constitutional lawyers would say that if she did withdraw her, her assent, she'd be essentially breaking the law. And so I think she she wanted to be um, faithful to her coronation oaths. But but also the oath, you know, asked that um, she, she uphold the teachings of the, the the, the, the gospel um, and the laws of God uh, to her utmost. That was that was what she was uh, she swore to do. But I think it was it was it's difficult in the in the way that the constitution is drawn up because the queen um, is sort of subservient to Parliament really. Um, and so, yeah. as I said in my piece, she she had to sort of put the democratic will of the of the country before uh, natural law. So I think she was very limited, of course, by what she could do. Um, but I think it was it, it was a shame because I think there were things which I think obviously she didn't agree with, but he was forced uh, really because of the constitutional role to give royal assent, which is, as, as you say, it's yeah. a formality and it, it doesn't really carry um, uh, the sort of authoritative weight that, uh, that perhaps a president well, might have. Well, we're going to get to this in a moment, but though she is the figurehead of the Church of England, she really, you know, she doesn't she doesn't run the show either in the church or in in the uh, the parliament or the country. So it, it is a ceremonial post, or it's been uh, relegated to that, in certainly in, in the modern age. Now, just last month, the Queen wrote to the Anglican bishops as they were getting ready to meet in London. And she wrote uh, this, throughout my life, the message and teachings of Christ have been my guide, and in them I find hope. It is my heartfelt prayer that you will continue to be sustained by your faith in times of trial and encouraged by hope at times of despair. Now, that's kind of a general, um, you know, sentiment. But Queen Elizabeth reigned for 70 years. And in that time, the world, especially the Western world, Joseph, have become more secular. What was her influence as a Christian leader in the UK during that period and now? Well, the first thing is, you know, that she was on the, on, on the throne, Queen of England for 70 years, and the gossip columnists in this age of, you know, where the, the ubiquitous power of the press to pry into everybody's private life, the gossip columnists don't have a single column inch on her. And that in itself, I think, uh, speaks volumes. It speaks for her mm. virtue. It speaks for the fact that she laid down her life for her people. No greater love as anyone than, than, than to lay down your life for your friends, says our Lord. And she did that in, mm. to, 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 an, to an exceptional and exemplary degree. And in that, she commands and demands the respect of everybody, irrespective of where you stand on on the monarchy, whether you're a monarchist or a Republican, as a person and as someone who devoted herself to her responsibilities to the nation. She is a, a role model that, sadly, that I don't think any politician could claim to come anywhere near during the same period. Mm. I agree. Uh, in, in his first address to the nation last Friday, King Charles had this to say about the monarchy's religious responsibility. Listen, I want to get into this. The role and the duties of monarchy also remain, as does the sovereign's particular relationship and responsibility towards the Church of England, the church in which my own faith is so deeply rooted. In that faith and the values it inspires, I have been brought up to cherish a sense of duty to others and to hold in the greatest respect the precious traditions freedoms and responsibilities of our unique history and our system of parliamentary government. Edward, he immediately placed faith into the context of the more secular values and duties. What do you make of this? Well, I think it, it, 
points to the fact that the the monarchy is very much um, seen. I mean, it is really a sacred institution, and it it goes back um, even though you know before the Church of England, it goes back, of course, to mm -hmm. when England was Catholic, and and I think it's retained that sort of spiritual element, uh, sort of spiritual aspect of the country, and that's why I believe it's still held in so much regard. It was doubly held in so much regard, I think, because the Queen was such uh, a faithful servant and she was devoted to her faith and to God and combined with the sacredness of the office, I think, is what made, made it so special. Um, and I think that Charles sees that and I think that's why he's, he's reflected on this and, and has said those words, because um, it really does show this, this deep, these deep roots in, in faith that are linked with his office. And um, as I say, it goes back very much to the church. And the yeah. coronation, it, interestingly, shows that. It shows very much the Catholic roots of, of this institute. Yes, which we'll watch in the days ahead. Um, but, but Edward, before I, I move on here to, to Joseph, um, Charles was raised principally by his grandmother, who was the queen mom, was a churchgoer. Um, what becomes of this connection to the Church of England under Charles? Or does it matter at this point? Well, I think he'll he'll do as his mother did, and and you know to carry out his role as supreme governor of the Church of England in the same way. Uh, I don't think it changes much. I think his, as Joseph said earlier, I think his faith has developed since those days when he wanted to be defender of faith. So I think he will take that role seriously, um, and probably fulfil it exactly as the Queen did. I, I don't think that will change. Yeah. I, I, I will play that bite for you. The, and, Joseph, you mentioned this earlier. There's that 1994 interview where Charles was asked uh, about this particularly, and he commented on the king's role as the defender of faith. Watch. I personally, you see, would much rather see it as defender of faith, not the faith, because it means just one particular interpretation of the faith which I think is sometimes something that causes a great deal of problem. It has done for hundreds of years. People have fought each other to the death over these things. It seems to me a peculiar waste of people's energy when we're all actually aiming for the same ultimate goal, I think. Your take on that, Joseph. What do you think that means? What does it tell us about the way he might rule uh, his, his uh, kingdom? Well, we have to hope that he's uh, grown up and matured a bit uh, since those uh, words were, were uttered, because, you know, he couldn't, at the end of it, explain, if, if you asked him directly, what is the goal? Because is he talking about, which gods he talking about, even? Or in the, is he talking mm -hmm. about any gods? Is, if, faith in what? It's, it's, it's so nebulous. It's so um, um, uh, relativistic. And it's that sort of modernism, theologically, which has led to the collapse of uh, the number of people actually going to Anglican Church. Uh, you know, G.K. Chesterton mm -hmm. famously said, we don't want a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. And it's that uh, courage of the conviction of the faith which brings people to church and brings people back to church. The abandonment of the faith for some sort of nebulous faith in any nothing in particular uh, is only going to mm. contribute to the continu continued decline of, 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 uh, of Anglicanism in the UK. Mm. Gentlemen, watching the Queen lying in state, the funeral at Westminster Abbey, the liturgical ritual of this, and as you alluded to, the, uh, the upcoming coronation, I, I want to give each of you a chance at this. Edward, what do you think is the impact in this modern age, in this modern world, when the whole world really is focused on these, what, what are essentially liturgical rituals? Yes, I think it's interesting. I mean, the reaction so far, I think people have, have been very struck by, by these, these rituals and the pageantry of, and the tradition that we see. Um, and I think it points them to something bigger than them and bigger than the institution itself, even. I think it points them to the, to the sacred. So in a sense, you've got these flashes of, of, of sacredness coming into a very secular world. And, and I think that's, that's, that's striking a lot of people. And I think they're realizing the importance mm -hmm. of of ritual and 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 sacredness, and I think this yeah. this whole this whole situation I think is is proving that and and reminding people. Of that. 
Yeah, and the, the solemnity and the history of it. And uh, Joseph, when I watched, uh, you know, the, the procession into Westminster Hall and you realize this thousand, uh, you know, year old structure and where Thomas More was sentenced, uh, so much happened there. The weight of that. These events, it seems to me, are charged. They are charged with a spiritual significance and a Catholic echo that, frankly, used to be the, the, the purview of Papal events that have lost some of that um, charge, if you will, and global attention. Yes, I think I think one of the important things, obviously, in an age that there's wallowing in the gutter, shall we say, that has uh, embraced meaninglessness, uh, moral anarchy, mm. and and political and philosophical relativism, uh, that seeing uh, something which is as edifying, something which is rooted in history, something with roots and with a past, is 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 going to. Uh, hold up and be seen to be something which edifies. It's an edifice. Edifices edify. And I think in an age in which um, we see this iconoclasm with the, the, the sacred being pulled down, I think there will be a hunger for the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I do think in the rituals surrounding uh, the monarchy, surrounding the funeral, surrounding the coronation when it happens, will, will, will enable people to see there is a transcendent splendor uh, in that which is rooted uh, in the collected human experience, which is lost in the anarchy of the times in which we find ourselves. Joseph Pierce, Edward Penton, thank you both for being here, for your insights, thoughts, perspective, and, of course, your great writings. Thank you both.